It reminded me that the time that Peter, when Jesus went and took the towel and began to wash the feet of the disciples at Passover. And Peter, he came to Peter to wash his feet. And Peter was real religious, you know, in those days. And Peter said, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus said to him, Peter, if I don't wash you, you can have no part of me. If I don't wash you, you will have no part in me. And Peter said this. He said, then, Lord, wash my head, wash my whole body, wash my hands, wash my feet, wash me all over. And the Lord Jesus answered him a very poignant statement. He said, Peter, he that is once washed, he that is once washed only needs his feet washed. Only needs his feet washed. And then he said, therefore, wash one another's feet. And we've made it a real religious thing. You know, we have foot washings and all that. That's fine. I believe there's a humility that brings when you have to wash somebody's feet. But I don't think it makes you more spiritual. I think it brings humility to the person having their feet washed and and it also brings humility to those who, who have to do the washing. But there was a greater purpose what he was saying. He said, once I've cleansed you, all you need is your feet, your walk. There needs to be a constant cleansing of your walk. No doubt about it that when we walk in this world, we walk in the midst of defilement. The whole picture was because they, they walked with sandals and their feet got dirty. They picked up the road grime and they had, to do, they had to wash their feet. But there's a principle that God wants us to strengthen one another, cleanse one another. And the thing is, we do the work, but the water does the cleansing. You see, we do the application, but it's the water that does the cleansing. You say, well, how does that work in a real spiritual sense? A real spiritual sense is a principle of speaking the word. We're washed by the water of the word. The true picture of the labor in the tabernacle of Moses was not really a full picture of water baptism. It was, it, was a, it was a picture of the cleansing of the hands and feet of the ministry of the priesthood. That they washed their hands before they could go in and function in the spiritual aspect. They had to wash their feet because the minute they stepped through that first curtain, it was holy ground. They had to be cleansed. They had to be purified. It's, it's an ongoing process for every one of us. That we constantly got to be washed. We may not think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, you know, that never happens. Well, let me tell you, it, it happens. We all need it. I need it. You need it. We all need this ongoing process in our life. We need this ongoing cleansing to take place in our life. What it does is it, it cleanses us from crazy thoughts. You know, the first thing is we don't realize what will happen to us is we'll run to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right and wrong, and all that, and that produces no life. And what God is trying to do with this is bring us and cleanse us of all them crazy things that we do over at that tree. Because that tree will kill you. Not only will it kill you, but it'll kill, you, kill those who you're trying to work with. But the tree of life is an ongoing process of cleansing and purifying and, 
and, and trusting God to do his life-giving work in our lives. I am... Um, I don't know how I'm going to be able to um, share today. I had a, had a half a dozen things. Maybe I better start with this next week. Brother Bud will be here. And some of the worship team will be missing. But, um, you know, we're, just because we're not going to be here doesn't mean the Holy Ghost is not going to be here. My name is not Holy Ghost. Neither is it Jesus. So the principle is come and add your part. Amen. And um, I'm not going to um, explain because uh, who never knows who's watching the internet. So, but the issue is that uh, Brother Bud is going to be speaking next week. So begin to pray for him. Begin to pray for Brother Bud this week and and, um, and, and that, God will, that God will use him as a servant to minister life to us. We still are cleansed by the washing of the water of the word. If you really understand that, the word, the word for word is logos. But the word logos is more than just the written word. That's a charismatic that's a charismatic statement. doesn't mean what the word is. It's not just the written word and the rhema word. The logos is the living word. It means the word including the thought or purpose behind it. Jesus became the very logos of God. He had the purpose, the thought behind it. Amen? Amen. The Rima word speaks of a word that's spoken into our life to bring us to the Logos word. The Rima word is a phrase or a statement. It's not just one word. It's a phrase or statement. It's more like the prophetic. The Rima word. Or the preaching of the word. That brings us to the real Logos of the word. That we become the very living word. The reality of the word. Whatever it is. And I... I look across the congregation today and I, I, I see four visitors. The rest of you are, are, I welcome the visitors. I'm glad you guys are here. We're more than happy with that. We, we love new people. We just love new people. Uh, one thing I can say is over the years, even though we've had great transition over the years in people coming and leaving, and, and if, if you don't realize it, in the past few weeks, there's been quite a few families that have left. Years ago, I used to take it personal. But I come to realize I might be the one that they accuse, but they're not mad at me. They're mad at God. They're not mad with me. They're mad with God. And I know another thing is I've been around here long enough to know that when a spirit of disgruntlement gets in the house and I have to admit that I wasn't quick enough to deal with it. We might have saved one or two. But you know what? We're going forward. We're going onward. And I'm, I'm just going to say this to every one of you that are here. Do not allow those that have gone that were disgruntled to plant their seeds in your life. Because if you'll do, you'll find yourself in the same teeter-totter they were in. Been there, done that. I got all the t-shirts. I, I now wear them out in the yard while I'm cleaning the yard. They're not there when I dress up. But I, I want to say something I, I've, I've tried for. I checked my notes. I, I do have my notes. I got my notes here. And I checked my notes and, 
And I go back, it reminds me that I went back in the first week of September. I began to try to share from Haggai and Zechariah. And over, the, over this period of time, I know that I've stood here and made some points and said some things. And, and, and we don't always understand the principle that the Old Covenant laid out for us, or the Old Testament. Every time we lead, read the prophets, we got to understand that Peter told us that the prophets had the Spirit of Christ in them. And Peter said it this way, they searched into the time and the manner of times that the Spirit of Christ that was in them did speak. But as far as time was concerned, say time. time. Say God is eternal, God is eternal. but he puts you and I in time. He puts us in time. Say so you picked the time, picked the place, picked our habitation, picked out your mom and daddy, like them or not, picked out your relatives, picked out the church he's going to put you in, happy or not. God picked it all out yes, sir. and sat there. Yes, sir. He decided whether you were black, white, pink, green, or yellow. Yeah. Of one blood made he all men on the face of the earth. Yes, of one blood. And he said in Joel, he said, I'll cleanse the blood that's not yet been cleansed. And so when we come to this aspect and realize what happened to Israel was because the prophets had warned the fathers. The prophets, God sent the prophets to warn the fathers. God never decided that the world was to be run by prophets. It was to be run by judges. And they didn't like the judges. They wanted a king. When God wanted to be their king. He wanted to be their owner, their master, their Lord, their, their absolutely everything, but he was going to minister who he was through the judges. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They were the ones to make the decisions. And when they decided they wanted a king like the rest of the world out here, say this church, this church. is not like, not like all the churches out there. God has given us our own personality. He picked this out. He's spoken the thing for it. He knows our end from the beginning. Amen. Yes, sir. Now, whether we make that end or not depends on us. Can I say that again? It's God's will that all men should be saved, delivered completely, Totally. And come to the full and the perfect and accurate knowledge of God. Till you know God so much that God is known in you. That's God's will. Does that always happen? No. Does it always turn out that way? No. Well, what happens, that's up to God to decide. But the bottom line is it becomes our choice. And so when I look over a congregation like this, I, 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 was, I was meditating during worship. You, you have to forgive me because I felt this pressure in my spirit. As, as I was meditating over worship, I heard Jesus say, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How I would have gathered you like a hen gathereth her chicks. And I have to say this. The love of God is in my heart for every one of you. Your homes, your family, your children. A lot of them that aren't here any longer. I think about the hundreds of people that have come and gone from this house. And God had the same purpose 30 years ago as he has today. 
The prophetic word that God has spoken over this house has not changed. It's up to us to decide whether we're going to fit in with what God says. That does not mean God hasn't blessed us. I chuckled um, um, today when, when um, Andy got into Proverbs and he started in Proverbs and he was talking about the foolish man and the wise man and um, say, I've done, I made a lot of foolish mistakes. Yeah, it's, it's like a parent having their first baby. They're learning how to be a parent and the baby's learning how to be a kid. And it's, it's, it's amazing that any of them survive. And so the same picture is when you begin to pastor church and you've never done that before. And you make a lot of mistakes. Sometimes you're too harsh and sometimes you're too soft. But over a period of time, you learn. By the time that second kid comes along, you think, boy, I got her down pat now. And you find out the kid is totally different. <laughs> and you can't apply things the way you used to apply things because it's a different child. It's a different situation, but it's the same purpose. So you're learning how to function with another personality, another person, another thing. You say, what are you saying all this for? Because I'm beginning to understand why the Lord didn't allow me to say anything about these two chapters, or these two books, Haggai and Zechariah. Because the picture here applies for us to this house. It's not a sad thing, it's a glorious thing. The whole purpose we have here in these two is building the temple of God. Paul, in writing to the church, Ephesus said this way, that we might become a holy habitation. And when I look across the congregation and I look at those that have been here with us almost from the beginning, there's only a few. But then we have those that have come in the next wave. They're in Tim's age and Brian's and Jennifer's and Stephen's and, and in that age, Ronnie and all, of the, and, and all of them have begun to flow in out of that age. Some have come and some have gone. But the purpose has never changed. God never changed his mind. He said, oh, well, if you don't become, he doesn't say, oh, well, if you don't become that, you can be this. No, 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 that isn't the way God works. God said, this is what you're to be. And that's it. And I'm going to work with you and I'm going to work through the situation with you until you become it. And if you and I don't do it, guess what? He'll move us off the scene and bring others in until he gets what he destined, he planned. That's the way it works. And so the whole purpose of Haggai and Zechariah was building this temple, they had come up out of Babylon. They'd been 70 years without the house of God. They, they were not the world out there. They were God's people coming back to the land. But they had lost sight of the whole thing. There were just a few old folks that saw the vision. Because Haggai, the old prophet, said, how many of you saw the first house? In all its glory. How many of you saw the first vision? How many of you really saw what God said he was after in this house? And there's a handful of us here that have seen that. It's more than a doctrine. It's more than a theory. It's the word. And that part of the word which God's spoken to us. But the one thing he said to Haggai, he said, Haggai, he said, I want to tell you this. He said, the glory of this latter house. 
What you first generation people didn't get done, I'm going to bring another generation that will take up the place, the slack. I think about it over the years that, that we've been together as a people and I think about the older generation that was with us and I begin to look around and I, I see a handful of the next generation. And now I'm beginning to see another generation. And I remember... I remember back in Chicopee, when we were in Chicopee the first year. We went there in September, right after Labor Day of 1984, and in the following year, in the spring, we had a conference in May. And I remember Bob Blackwell standing by the door by the electrical panel and began to prophesy. And he prophesied over us that we would see in our own life. He said that one of the things that we had been prophesied more than once over the fact that not one hoof would be lost of all our family. And then he began to prophesy that you'll see the fourth generation. You wonder why I was so excited when Danielle, I was after her for year, two years. She got married. I said, let's get with it, girl. <laughs> just getting married stuff isn't just for fun. This is for having babies. <laughs> and she kept saying, you're pressuring me. You're pressuring me. <laughs> well, it worked out all right because I found the scripture that says that if somebody gets married, they don't go out to war for the first year. So they're to, they're to learn how to get together. So, I, I, you know, I backed off a little bit. But I've seen my fourth generation. But that's just the beginning. You say, why are you saying all of this? Because I believe that God wants to say something to us. Say something to us as a house, as a people, and it's right here. Because we find that in these two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, one of the scriptures says, and, and they prospered at the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah. They prospered. Why did they prosper? Because they paid attention to the prophetic word of God that was spoken over the Even though they couldn't see it, even though they couldn't understand it, even though they didn't know what it was going to be, but the prophetic word that was over them caused them to prosper. Yes, sir. Amen. I've looked across this house and said, one of the great things God has always done, he's prospered us. We've never worried about money. Um, one of the things that, that, that Andy, when he was dealing with Proverbs this morning, if you go to the next verse, which is 15, the Lord says the silver and gold's mine. It's all his. What is God talking about? He can give you as much money as he can trust you with. <laughs> can I talk a little bit? I, I sat down last night about 6 o'clock. Sister Fran turned the TV on. I sat down in the chair. She turned the History Channel on. And what it was dealing with, it was about how America got started over the big, the big powerful people like the Rockefellers and, and the J.P. Morgans. And, and that I watched that whole thing. And while I'm watching that whole thing, I'm listening to the voice of God. The voice of God is saying, I put them in in place. Nobody liked them. But this was my purpose for the country. Because in the end of their lives, they gave their money all away. They didn't want to give up Standard Oil. So the court broke them up into 13, was it 13 or 23 country, companies. Guess what? He made more money out of the 23 than he did out of the one. Standard Oil. And then in, in the end of their life, they got in a competition to see who could give the most away. Do you know that there's more than 60 libraries in big cities 
that were never built by the people, but, but they were built by the Carnegies. America was started with a purpose, with a direction, a God-divine plan. We were started with a purpose and a God-divine plan. And the plan that I've seen in the Word was a corporate body, a corporate understanding that works in the greatness and the fullness of God. Sonship, what is sonship? We are sons, but we're not fully manifest what we should be. And here's Haggai and Zechariah, the old prophet and the young prophet. And they're prophesying at exactly the same time in the second year of Darius the king. Haggai prophesied for approximately 90 days. It caused the leaders of the country, the one, Zerubbabel and jo, Josiah, um, jo, uh, the, Joseph, I don't want to say Josephus, that was the guy I met yesterday. <laughs> Joshua, Zerubbabel and Joshua are a picture of the Christ. Those two are a picture of Christ. Now, let me stop here. Here's another issue we have to deal with. The Christ was before Jesus. He was from the beginning. Jesus never became a little literal reality till that seed was planted in the womb of that virgin mother. What was planted in her womb was the seed of the Christ. But the Christ had already been in them prophets. Are you, are you all with me? So the picture of the Christ is the picture of Zerubbabel and Joshua. One is the governor, the king, and the other is the priest. It's a king-priest ministry. It's a king priest reality. And so in Haggai's prophecy, he says this. He said, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands are going to finish it. Say, God started us out, and God's going to finish us. We move from faith. To faith. God gives us beginning faith and then he gives us finishing faith or the faith of God. And the whole purpose is, is to develop a house that God can live in. And that isn't just when you come to church. It's easy to put on your church face the mask. It's easy to do that. Put on your church face. It's easy. God wants you to be the church. God wants you to be the holy habitation. God wants you to be that at all times. But I, I don't want to go there. But at the same time, Haggai is prophesying about this and God is revealing to him somebody had to get started. Say thank you, Pastor Dale. You and Sister Fran, you and Sister, Fran. Sister, Irene, Sister Irene, those that have been here from the beginning, been here from the beginning. Laid, the laid the foundation. They got it started. But there had to arise another prophetic voice at the same time. Not in disagreement, but in agreement. And here comes Zechariah. And he begins to prophesy. He begins to pick up the same word that the Lord does, but he takes it into deeper dimensions because he had to remind them. He had to tell them some of the things they had totally forgotten. 
And when you get with Zechariah back in, I, I'm not going to cover it all today. I can't. But when he got with Zechariah, Zechariah began to reveal to them about the four horsemen. The four horsemen were not four horses. They were the insignia. They were the signs. They're the picture of the four living ones. The four, the, the, the four horses of the book of Revelation. All of that is just a picture. It's a picture of God's plan. God's way of doing things. God getting it done. You've heard me over and over and over again mention to you about Ezekiel. While the Israelites were in captivity by the river Kibar, they were saying, sing us those glorious songs of Zion. They said, oh, we can't. We hung our harps on the willow tree. They lost all hope in who they were and who they're going to be in 70 years. Let me ask you this. If you walk out the door of this house today, how long could you be outside before you lose your hope? And they lost their hope. But Ezekiel, the priest of the Most High God, with the Spirit of Christ in him, he's six miles down on a Kibar River and he's seeing visions of God. What's he looking at? He isn't looking up into the heavens. He's looking at Israel. He's looking at them people. And he's seeing God in their midst. God's manifest in their midst. God was doing it. He saw everything that was there from the book of Numbers. He saw their encampment around about the tabernacle. He saw the picture of their banners and their inside. And he was declaring that God was mighty in their midst. And they didn't even know it. I declare to you today, God's bigger in you than you recognize. Yes, sir. Greater is he that is in you Amen. and the world that you're in. Yes. Amen. Amen. What is it that holds us back from releasing all that God is? The holy habitation of God. The whole purpose of God. What is it that holds us back? How is it that we realize, we understand the fact that the corporate anointing, the anointing on all of us is greater than the anointing on any one of us. And the anointing is given us to break the yokes in our lives that we will not recognize. But we find every excuse for not getting together. I can show you a little foundation when we began. Our young people would go look for a job and tell them, I'm not working on Thursday nights. I'm not working on Sundays. And they got jobs and they made it. You say, ah, oh, that's legalism. No, it isn't. It depends on where your heart is. It's in your pocketbook or it's in the purpose of God in your life. Because God said, yeah, I, hold, I, I, I got the, the gold on a thousand hills. I, I own all the cattle. I own everything. I, I own the banks. I own the stock market. I own it all. It's mine. And so when we get into Zechariah, we find that Zechariah has to tell the head guy. It's not going to be by might. It's not going to be by your understanding. It's not going to be by your study. It's going to be by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen. Yes, sir. If my spirit is not having free reign in every aspect of your life, guess what? But he's going to keep working until he does. And the first thing we find it over in the third chapter, he identifies the one who is going to build this house. It's the branch man. I've seen churches build on the prophetic. I've seen churches married. I just talked to a brother yesterday about a church that was married, was built on marriage, marriage counseling. Hundreds of people. Got delivered. 
Hundreds of people came to the Lord, got their marriages straightened out. Then boom, a bomb comes. And a church that was five, six hundred people isn't even in business anymore. You say, why does that happen? Because it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my spirit, says the Lord. What's his spirit? His spirit is developing a corporate man, a corporate entity called the branch man. The branch man is the man that's going to build the house. He's got to be a branch off the vine, off the off this, the main shaft. It's a picture of the candlestick with the, with the branches off the main shaft and they get their oil poured into them from the two trees. And when you say, what is those two trees in Zechariah? They are called the two anointed ones. But if you break it down, the word Ben is in there, which means the builder of the family name. What's the family name? It's Christ. Christ. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Your family name isn't it. The name is Christ. You, when you go down in the waters of baptism, you don't get baptized in the name of Jesus only. You get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ is not his second name. It's not his last name. It's his family name. It's his function. It's who he is. It's what he does. It means the anointing or the anointed one. It's not by might. It's not by power, church. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. It's not by your reasoning minds. It's a God. He is building himself a branch man. A branch man. And Zechariah spells the whole thing out. God gives him the picture all the way through. He said, what is this picture of these four horsemen? What are these pictures? They are pictures of the four winds. They are pictures of God is sent to and fro throughout all the earth. But every place God plants it, he plants it. He plants a shoot off the vine. You say, what are you saying all this for? Because I'm telling you there's got to arise. I, I'm, I'm, I'm nailing down on this next generation right now. Some of you are going to have to cry out to see the fulfillment of God's purpose in this house. Somebody is going to have to cry out. Somebody is going to have to allow God, of this next generation, allow God to pick them up. All I was was an electrician minding my business. I liked vacations. I liked all the things that everybody else did. But when God said go, I had no clue what it was going to turn out to. That was 30 years ago this year. We went on a five-day vacation, never went home. And guess what God gave us? We left our family, our kids, but look what he gave us. He gave us a whole new family. He gave us a whole new people. Gave us, gave us things that we couldn't imagine. Caused us to do what we couldn't imagine. I was not a preacher. I, I, I sat with this brother yesterday and he kept saying, he kept saying, I'm not a trained pastor. I, I never went to school. And, and all of a sudden the Spirit of God rose up in me and I said, don't say that again. Because all you got to do is go to Bible school and then you got to unlearn everything they taught you. You got to let the Holy Ghost 
You gotta let the spirit of God, it's not by might, it's not by power, it's not by Rima Bible College or Fuller Theological Seminary or by Dallas Theological Seminary or, 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 or any one of them, Moody's or any one of them. They were gracious, wonderful people, but in this hour, it's gonna be not by might nor by power. God is raising a new house. God is raising a new tabernacle. And this next generation is going to have to begin to say, I want it. I want it. I really don't know what happened to Haggai after this. I really don't know. It really doesn't say. But let me read you the last verse. And again, the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the 420th day of the month. Speaking to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I'll overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I want to tell you what, God has done that ever since we began. Every one of you came in here with your own kingdom and your own kingly ideas. And if you haven't gone through shake and bake, just hang on. He will. I'll shake the heavens, the earth. I'll overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'll destroy the strength of kingdoms of the heathen. The, the, the word is nations, but it better be translated here. Say, come on, come on, imaginations. My imaginations. And I will overthrow chariots and those that ride in them and the horses and their riders shall come down and every one by the sword of his brother. Isn't that amazing? In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, I will take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shelatiel, saith the Lord, and I'll make thee as a signet or as a sign. The signet was a sign. It was a surety. It was a guarantee. Zerubbabel's hands will begin it and his hands will finish it. That does not mean, that does not mean, for us, that does not mean I'm going to be here forever. Now I want to be here, but there was nothing that would, would make me any happier than to see the rising of a new generation yeah. of prophetic voices that are willing Amen. to understand the purposes of what God wants this house for. Yes, is this your farewell speech? Absolutely not. This is my challenge to the next generation. I sat with that young man yesterday. He's 38 years old. And I sat with him yesterday and heard his heart. And I thought, God, there's another one. Because most of what goes on and most of this stuff has no idea what God's purpose is. We just went through a 30-day thing that we need to learn to pray the will of God. The will of God is his purpose. The will of God is what he's after. The will of God is what God planned from the beginning. His whole idea wasn't to just cause us to be good so we could die and go to heaven. And then he turned around and teaches us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I want to tell you what, his kingdom is already here. Yes, sir. Yes, it is. Where the king is, Amen. the kingdom is there. Amen. 
if the king is inside of you, the kingdom is already here. It may not be yet fully manifest out there, but the king is here. And his kingdom is here. And the truth of the matter is that we would listen to the voice. Jesus never spoke until he heard his father speak. What we need is ears to hear and eyes to see. We need to hear the voice of the Spirit instead of what somebody told us. Including me. I challenge you, go to the Word. Don't go to the commentaries. Don't go to them. Go to the Word. Let the Word speak to the Word. And if you don't want to do that, go back there and get that book whose right it is. There's only one whose right it is. It's Jesus Christ. But most of us have never studied the scriptures enough to understand that when it says Jesus Christ in the Bible, sometimes Paul in his writing, if you look at it in the Greek, it says the Christ Jesus. And multitudes of times in Paul's writing, most of the time people are thinking about the individual when he's talking about head and body. That's the habitation of God. That's the purpose of God. My cry is this today. Lord, raise up a people with eyes to see and ears to hear. Set the fire of God and call of God into another generation. That when this older generation, I, I, I look at Brother Bud. I, when Bud came here, you know, his hair was black. Bernadette was still blonde. Well, Danny and I haven't used uh, uh, just for men yet, but we, 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 we've considered it. Think about it, though. Your day is coming. It's like that, and the next thing you know, you're old. And the key is for every one of us. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking right down the gun barrel, and you're all looking at me like, and that doesn't leave anybody out. That leaves nobody out. Because everybody loves to do the same thing. But the bottom line is, to me, the house of God and his purpose is of utmost And that's why I'm, I'm saying what I'm saying, because I saw this. I saw all of this. I saw this as our house. There's got to be a voice that rises up, this Zechariah voice that rises up, and he prophesies exactly the same thing that the old man saw, only he explained it in a deeper dimension. Talks about the latter rain. I can't. I can't. I can't do all of that. I can't. I can't go into all of that. The greatest thing I think about Zechariah is the last verse of the fourteenth chapter, and in that day there shall be no more Canaanite in the house of the Lord of Hosts. That's the merchandiser. I've been sick over the merchandiser in the house of God. Doesn't mean that God won't. won't you, the Bible says you don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. You don't do that. It's not wrong. It's not wrong to earn a living in the gospel. It's not wrong. It's not wrong. But the bottom line is the merchandising of the gospel. The merchandising of it. 
They're all in it for something. Without purpose. And God's purpose is that the whole house be filled with his glory. That's his purpose. Yes, sir. Amen. I made this statement over here again. I used it yesterday with the pastors. We'll all get along a whole lot better, brothers, when we come to realize Luke 19 and 10. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. That'll change your whole outlook. Not those. He came to seek and save that which was lost. What was lost? Well, here's a little picture. Here's another little thought. It says in Genesis, that before God had ever let it rain, there was a mist that rose up and watered the earth. We got revival prayers all over the planet. God, come start a revival. If we're going to reestablish what was lost, it's got to come out of here. That's it. Yeah. Yes. The mist has got to rise out of here. Because he said in the days, the, the days of Noah, it'll be like the days of Noah. It rained, all, that's all we look at. It never rained before that. It rained for 40 days. And we thought that that's what flooded the earth. It says the waters of the deep were broken up. And I, I found myself last evening laying in the bed about 2.15 or 2.20, I woke up. And I found myself laying in the bed crying out, God, let the waters of the deep of every one of us be broken up. Let the mist arise and water the garden. All God wants us to do is till the ground. It's God that gives the increase. It is God that works it. It is God. All he wants us to do, beloved, is allow the waters to be broken up on the inside. Until we become fruitful. Until we become what we're supposed to be. Say we're not what we're supposed to be? No, he's got us right where, we want, where he wants us right now. But now he's saying to us, it's time. It's time. It's time. It's time for the, for the next generation, the Zerubbabels of this hour, to get the same vision that Haggai had. It's time. It's time for the waters of the deep to be broken up in our lives. It's time. Because everything we set as security in our lives can be gone like that. Just ask all the people that are my age that decided the best place to get health insurance was with AARP. A hundred and thirty thousand in the last week had their insurance canceled. See, we, we're blaming it on politics. It isn't politics. It's God trying to get our attention. It's God shaking everything. It's God. He's, he, we cannot put our trust in anything but God. He said, well, how are we going to get taken care of? He said, I never see my children in the street begging bread. I hate beggars. That's why I don't talk about money. I hate beggars. I hate Canaanites. You say, that's not right. Well, let me read you the Bible. Is that all right? He said, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. All you got to do is follow the lineage of Ham from Noah down. Read 
Read your Bible, folks. Don't just read your Bible. Read your Bible and think and allow the Holy Ghost to talk to you. And let him say, when it's all over with, I'll tell you what you're going to say. You're going to say, God, oh my God. How in the world did you ever let me know this? Why wasn't you out someplace, somewhere else? You're here by divine appointment. You're here to, by the divine calling of God. You're here by the Spirit of God. Read. I want everyone in this room to read Acts 17 until you get it in your spirit. I'm not here by choice. I'm here by His picking. Say, God, pick me out for a day like today to challenge me, become a prophetic voice with the purpose of God in my mouth. I love you. I love you. More than you know. You say, is this your fair? It sounds like a farewell speech. No, it isn't. I'm challenging you. I'm going to keep challenging you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you any more uh, fairy tales. I can tell you how God good, good God is. That is. But until you begin to realize your responsibility, I'm going to stay on your case. It's an hour. It's a time. You better get before him until you hear his voice and find out what his giftings and his callings are in your life. I love you. I love you. I love you. Boy, you don't get it too much. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, I just thank you today for this people. Lord, I, I thank you, Lord, that you give us the opportunity to, to love on them and to challenge them and declare your purpose before them. Father, with these two prophets, Father, I see the old and I see the young. And I see, God, the responsibility is the same to build the house of God, to build the temple, to allow the house of God to be brought into fruition, Father, I pray that for everyone in this room that the fire of God, the hunger of God, the th you said that those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, after right doing, they'll be filled. So God, I pray over them, Father, that there comes a fresh hunger, that there comes a fresh thirsting, that there comes fresh fire, God that would burn up all the wood to hay the stubble and purify the precious stuff in their lives. Great people, God, that you can do great things in and through. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Love you all.